Well, good morning, church. So glad you are here. First John 5 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that in him we have what we've asked in him. When we can approach the throne of God with boldness as his children, let's approach the throne of God and worship to him this morning. We invite you to join us. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures of faith are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. It's now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing, no, better than you. Oh, there's nothing, better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you see me fall, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find.
you can be seated. Registration for Mega Camp at VBS is open today. Be sure to register early so your child will get their top choice. Mega Camp at VBS will take place June 2nd through the 6th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. If you are interested in volunteering, please stop by the Kids Check-In Desk today. Hey ladies, join us Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. for our first Monday Farewell Until Fall Fiesta. We will have a night of fellowship, fun, and yummy food. Invite a friend, bring your favorite Mexican dish to share, and come enjoy the fiesta. As always, child care is available. See you there. As summer approaches at First Baptist Joplin, we are preparing for an exciting season of camps and events for you. Be sure to visit firstjoplin.org slash summer to register for camp or to explore our lineup of events like Midweek Blast. Mark your calendar so you don't miss out on the fun. Well, once again, we want to say welcome and thank you for uh, worshiping with us here at First Baptist Church this morning. If you're a first-time guest in the room, we're so glad that you are here. If you'll find that Connect card in the seat back in front of you, we want you to consider just filling that out for us, giving us a little information about you so we can give you some information about us. Uh, if you'll fill out that card or if you'll take advantage of the digital option that will also be up on the screen, if you shoot that QR code, you can fill out a digital Connect card. If you'll show that to one of our greeters or give them that card, they would love to give you a gift just for being here this morning just to say thank you for being here and worshiping um, with us. Uh, members, that, just a reminder, that's not only for guests, that's for members to connect to a small group, connect to a place to serve, uh, connect if you need to make an address change or uh, information change, anything for your uh, records, and also a prayer request card. If you'll flip that over, you can say whether you want that to stay with just the staff or to go out on the church uh, prayer request list. So there's a lot of um, a lot of ways we can use those cards, and we want to make sure and connect with both new, new members, uh, new, new people, and uh, our guests and uh, members as well. A busy, busy time of life right now heading into summer. You heard on the announcements, there's a lot of things coming up. Stay on track with the app. If you haven't downloaded that yet, find that First Joplin app download um, where you can stay connected to all the social media posts, all the digital bulletins, things that go out and reminders. Um, along with summer coming up is our graduation season. We've got graduation parties, graduation ceremonies, um, a lot of busy time for a lot of folks. We had uh, a great, great time with our high school graduates over at a breakfast at the 9 o'clock service. Um, our college grads went out last night with Ryan uh, for a dinner to honor them. We've, had, we, we've moved from bringing them up here in front of the church on a Sunday morning in service to a private time uh, where we can have kind of more intimate times, more time to share, uh, pour into them and their families and say thank you. We've given them a gift from the church. All the things that we used to do, we've just taken it out of our service um, for time's sake, but also just to say, hey, it's important enough for us to set aside a time for you and your family to come, and we want to serve you breakfast, we want to serve you dinner, uh, and just have a time of just talking with you across the table, fellowshipping um, together. We had 19 high school graduates. Uh, I believe we have six, seven uh, college graduates this year. If you came in early, you saw the slideshow going across. If you missed it, stay after church. It'll scroll through back again. But if you are a high school graduate, college graduate, or a family member of one of them, would you please stand up so we can just honor you and say congratulations? All over the room. Don't be shy. I know you're here. Come on, come on, come on. So proud of you and your accomplishments. So, so proud. Church, thank you so much for loving on those uh, graduates, loving on their families. Know that we're continuing to pray for you as graduates. We're continuing to pray for you as parents. We know the job does not stop now, um, but an, an exciting season of life for both high school graduates and college graduates as well. We're going to enter into a time of worship through our giving. We've got plates along the front. We've got a black box in the back. We've got online giving options, mail-in giving options. And church, we always want to say thank you for being faithful to give back to God's ministry uh, here at First Baptist Church and his work, his kingdom work that goes out from here. High school graduates and families, one person you need to try to connect with uh, before you leave today or sometime after today, get some information, is Ryan Young. Ryan's going to come and pray for us, but he is our college minister. Uh, make sure you connect with him as you go out of high school ministry and storehouse ministry. We want you to, to jump right into our Connect College ministry, and uh, he would love to get to know you guys uh, today and on into the future, let you know the opportunities that we have for college students. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We do lift up our graduates and their families. We pray for them as this time of transition can bring a lot of thoughts, but we ask that you would just comfort them and be with them. We pray for the students that you would give them guidance and direction in whatever this new chapter looks like for them. We thank you for the opportunity as a church to be able to not only minister them today, but, but throughout the years as well. We thank you for this um, 
this day that you have given us to set aside to, to honor them too. God, we pray as we continue to worship that you would be the, the centermost part of our thoughts. God, that we ask that, that your name would be honored as the word is preached and as we continue to worship in song and in giving. We just ask, Lord, that you would receive all the praise and all the honor. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue worshiping together, church. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever be, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you, Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name, yeah. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, sing it, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up. Holy, 
There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my heart. Show me. To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity Believe this there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy. We prayed in desperation Songs of faith We sing through doubt and fear In the end We'll see that it was worth it When he returns To wipe away our tears Amen Cause there will be Join the resurrection <laughs> and stand beside all the heroes of the faith. Amen. And with one voice, a thousand generations. What will they sing, church? Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Sing it again. Pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to move.
in our hearts and our minds as we look into your word. God, speak to us, change us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. A lot of people have a lot of thoughts or opinions or beliefs about who Jesus is. They may or may not be accurate, so we wanted to be sure to go to God's Word to find out who Jesus said he was in his own words. And in doing that, we're going through the Gospel of John, investigating the seven claims that Jesus made with divine authority, saying, I am, beginning it with I am. And that was the name that when Moses asked, when he, before he went in to deliver God's people, he asked God, who will I tell them sent me when they ask me for your name? And God said, I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent me. Talks about God's self-sufficiency, his eternal, his eternal nature. Speaks how he is not dependent on anyone and outside of all things, yet lovingly involved. And here Jesus in the fifth of these seven claims gives us something different. And I don't know any other way to say it than that. The one this morning and the two next week are just different. You see, in all of the I am claims that Jesus has made up to this point, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. And I am the door. All four of those I am claims pertained predominantly to issues of life. Food, light for life, shepherd protection, a gate for entrance. But this one's different. Jesus makes a claim and directs it directly at man's greatest enemy, man's most dreaded enemy, which is death. Jesus speaks this claim to remind us that death does not have the victory in the life of the follower of God, amen? We've all been touched by death. Unfortunately, I was able to even speak with a couple this morning, two, two different families whose lives have been touched by death. We all are going to experience it if the Lord tarries. And here's what we know about death. It's awful. I can only think of a few moments where death has been a welcomed entrance. Most of the time it is awful. It leaves people weeping and sorrowful for the loss because we know all too well what makes it awful is its ability to separate. Death is the final separation, we believe, physically, that now no longer once death has taken our friend, our family member, our loved one, we know that death separates us and that in this life we are not able to speak or commune or fellowship we are not able to embrace that person that's dead because we know that death separates. We also know that death is a fact. Whether I believe it or not, it's going to happen to us all. I don't believe there are any of us that are as delusional to walk in here and believe that death is not something that is a reality in our life. It happens to every one of us. In fact, if you go back and try to find where death came from, 
The Bible mentions death for the very first time in the book of Genesis, actually in the Garden of Eden of all places. God told Adam and Eve that they could eat of any tree in the garden they wanted, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they shall not taste or touch. And God said, lest you touch, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the, that day you will surely die. God said that in the book of Genesis. And the day you eat of it, you will surely die. You may remember, a oh, ways back we addressed that very topic. But that's the first time that death is mentioned. Everything before that is creation and life and good. But God said, if you sin, if you disobey, the day you eat, you will surely die. And that death did not just affect Adam and Eve as they sinned by partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sin. We realize that death is a reality, but it is a reality because of sin and because we have all sinned, we all die. As Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sins shall surely die. And Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Death is awful. Death is a fact. One thing we also know about death is it is mysterious. It's shrouded in a veil. And even as followers of Christ, we know what the Bible teaches about death. And if you don't, praise the Lord, you're here on the right Sunday. We're going to learn exactly what happens to death for the life of the believer. But there's still a segment of mystery surrounding it. We know that death is what separates our soul from our body, and our soul gets to go be with the Lord for those who've placed their faith and trust in Christ, and we know that for those who haven't, there is eternal torment that lies await on the other side of that door of death. But for us, even though we're believers, there's still a bit of mystery. When is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? What exactly are the details? And many of the details are mysterious. Though we may be grounded by a truth of eternal life, Oftentimes, some of the other areas or considerations of death leave, are mysterious. But we do know, praise the Lord, that from Jesus' claim in verse 25 and 26 in John chapter 11, we know that death is not the end. We are souls after all. We think of our bodies that have a soul, but as C.S. Lewis said, we are not bodies that have a soul. We are souls that have a body. And to fully understand and appreciate the claim that I'm about to read, I think it's important that we understand and appreciate the, the circumstances that surrounded Jesus' claim when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So if you have your Bibles open or your devices marked to John chapter 11, I want to start reading the initial claim that Jesus makes in verse 25 and 26, and then I want to go back and, and review this very long story, and, and I'll tell you, I'm not reading every tag, every verse of this 44-verse uh, chapter account of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So I hope this morning, as we touch on different segments of this story throughout this message, I hope that it whets your appetite to go home and further study and meditate on and consider the, the greatness of this 44-verse story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Verse 25 and 26, here is the I am claim. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This claim is not made in a vacuum. There's an event going on, and we're going to learn much about Jesus and hopefully much about ourselves. And this morning, if you walk in here and you say, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm not worried about death, death is not mysterious to me, I am prepared for death, I hope this morning you do not just find an answer to what happens and knowing that Jesus is speaking into the bottom of that six-foot hole, I hope this morning that you will have faith not just to die, but faith to live this morning. Because I believe when we understand that end and we have secured our eternal destiny in Christ, it gives us an unusual faith to be able to live fearless and courageous, bold lives for the cause of Christ. John chapter 11, verse 1 through 16, please. Now a certain man was ill 
Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. That's significant. He whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There's love again. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after these sayings, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant he was taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Wow. Heavy topic, huh? A lot of death, a lot of love. John, probably greater than any other of the disciples or any of the other gospel writers, has a knack for taking the divinity and the humanity of Jesus and slapping them so close together. We're just truly left in awe. And as is the case in John 11. You're going to see the heights of the divinity and the power and the majesty of Jesus. And you're going to see the depth of his relationship and condescension to the hurts and the pain of his people. And John slaps them right together. But in this, John leaves us in this description with an interesting concept that I think is incredibly beneficial to us. He tells us that Mary and Martha, whom Jesus loves, send, them, send word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. So he's very sick. And we can understand that as Mary and Martha are sending word to Jesus about their sick brother, who they know Jesus loves, they are having it, they have an expectation that Jesus, we can derive from this, that they have this expectation that Jesus is going to come and heal Lazarus. That's the understood expectation of their invitation for Jesus to come. They, they want him to heal him. And they say as much later in the story. And if you notice, it says that when Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, he delays going for two days. Now, that doesn't make sense to us. And I want you to, I want to look at three things this morning about this story for the purpose of hopefully, hopefully being able to encourage us in the middle of our questions, in the middle of our pain, not just giving us a faith to die with, but a faith that is able to live with. And if you notice, number one this morning is this, is that Lazarus got sick and died. That's a big duh, okay? I understand that. I'm talking about Lazarus, and you're like, oh, man, this pastor, he's a real scholar, right? John chapter 11, point number one, Lazarus got sick and died. Woo! I want you to think about something for a moment, because I think there's a message in there. The Bible tells us in just a few short words, in a few short verses, that Jesus loved Lazarus and Lazarus loved Jesus. It tells us in just those few short verses that Mary and Martha loved Jesus, and Jesus loved Mary and Martha. I'm reminded of this when I step back and remove myself and just read this story. I'm reminded of a truth that I need to be reminded of more often, is that just because Lazarus loved Jesus did not omit him 
from the pain, from disease, from sickness. And sometimes that's a lesson I need to be reminded of. Just because Lazarus loved Jesus and just because Jesus loved Lazarus did not mean he was immune to the hard, difficult, painful things of life. And we don't want to think like that. I don't want to think like that. I'm not trying to say that about you, but I know as a, general, as a general rule, for the most part, we feel like if I love Jesus and Jesus loves me, in our minds, we may begin to believe that that love will translate into the fact that I'm not going to get sick, I'm not going to endure hardship, my kids are never going to go off track, I'm never going to have relationship problems, I'm not ever going to get that dreaded call from the doctor, and you know what? That's not taught anywhere in the scriptures. Jesus' love for me and my love for him does not make me immune to discomfort, to inconvenience, and to really bad, painful, hurtful situations. Just like we learned last week is that that gate, when it's open and the shepherd is there at the door, there's nothing going to come in my life that has not been able to pass through the shepherd. And there's a purpose for it. But I often want to believe God. What do we say? For those of you that are here that have been in ministry for very long, for those of you that are here that have been followers of Christ for long and you've been reaching out and connecting with family members who are hurt or experiencing death or sickness or traumatic incidences in life, what are we tempted to say? Why me? Why this? Why now? And at the heart of that question, why me? Why this? Why now? At the heart of that question lies this idea that because I love Jesus and he loves me, I'm immune from this. And when I get to the bottom of this and realize that my relationship with Jesus does not make me immune to the issues of life, I'm able then to tackle the very heart of that because you know what's really dangerous? What is really, really dangerous? When I start believing in my mind that my love for Jesus and his love for me is going to make me immune to the situations and the hurts of life, I can really start to believe that my love for him or my devotion for him is nothing more than a, a currency or a leverage I'm trying to get to make my life easier. If I'm really careful... If I'm not really careful, that's what it can devolve into. God, I've served you for years. God, I've done my, my very best to raise my family in the right way. God, I, I, I took those vows seriously. God, I, I've, I've, I've been faithful to you for so long, and then this is what happens? I hope that we would be cautious to not ever have our faithfulness to God. Simply be reduced to a currency Reduced to leveraging God in our heart to want to do something for our good. Because here's the truth. God's glory, and this is a hard truth, hard. God's glory supersedes our circumstances, convenience, and comfort. God's glory supersedes all those things. So if I take all of this, what does Jesus say about Lazarus? It's good that I wasn't there. Why? That you might believe. This is not, this is not gonna be end in death, Jesus says. This is for the glory of God. What if I were able to view all of my circumstances in life, even though I can't understand it and I wonder what God's doing, wouldn't that be great if, like the story shows us, this, this Google Earth view, Mary and Martha weeping, they're disappointed, and here's Jesus delaying, right? Wouldn't that be great if we could view these circumstances in the same light of this story? Being able to step back saying, Jesus, I don't know what you're doing, I don't know why you seem so distant. I don't know why you're not answering my prayers in the way that I'm praying. I don't know why you're not relieving this, but I know you're doing something. Wouldn't that be great? And of that something, God, you're doing something that is going to bring glory and honor to you, and that's what this story does. Jesus promises that this death of Lazarus is going to bring glory to the one to whom glory is deserving, and that is Jesus Christ. His delay was a divine delay for the purpose of reminding us that his glory is to be greater and circus and supersedes our circumstances, convenience, and comfort. 
Number two, Jesus stepped into a hopeless situation. This morning, I hope we're able to see that this is not just a narrative account of one of the greatest miracles in the New Testament. I hope we're able to see this narrative as a picture of the gospel being lived out. You see, you have a man dead, separated. Can't be reached, can't raise himself back to life. And what do we have? We have Jesus coming to the very place of death. I want you to see for a moment and be reminded of what the scripture says regarding this place that Jesus was going to. Look in verse 7 and 8 of John 11, please. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? They're saying, Jesus, what are you doing? They don't like you there. They want to kill you. Typically, you want to stay away from places where people want to kill you. And now, you're wanting to go back there? Remember, they've identified as followers of Christ, so they're on the line as well. And they're telling Jesus that they're angry at you. They're hostile. And you're wanting to walk back into that situation? In fact, look in verse 16. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Friends, I don't think for a moment, I think he's literally meaning, let's go. If Lazarus is dead, Jesus is there, Jesus, let's all go. It'll be a big death party. I don't know what his motive was behind it. All I know is what he said. Let us also go with him that we may die with him. Thomas, if I take him at face value, was believing that when we get back in there, it's so hostile, they're going to kill you and us. Jesus walked into a hostile environment. Oh, now look at verse 21. Jesus shows up on the scene, and here comes Martha. Verse 20, excuse me. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Oh. And if that wasn't enough, look at verse 32, please. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus stepped into a hopeless situation with hostile enemies, with questions, and without, he stepped into people who were disappointed they loved their brother they knew jesus loved him and in their mind they couldn't wrap their mind around why jesus didn't come when we called him they didn't understand because why death is it when death comes that's it death separates they couldn't get by remember for a moment mary and martha are still expressing faith i think this is important Mary and Martha are still expressing their faith in Christ because they believe that if Jesus would have been here before he died, they, he would have healed them. That's, that's their mind. They know, Jesus, if you were here when we would have called, you would have healed him and he never would have died. And you can hear the disappointment in their voice. You can feel it. Both Mary and Martha repeating the exact same words. No doubt they had had this conversation at the table weeping. If Jesus would have only come. Still expressing faith. Faith that Jesus could heal him. But not the faith that Jesus could raise him. Because death is it, right? It wasn't just that. Look with me in verse 37. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? There were not just hostile enemies and questions and disappointment. There was doubt. It looked like a big loss. It looked like Jesus just didn't come through. And here's the big truth of Jesus in this hopeless situation. And that's that Jesus did not avoid the difficult situation. Jesus did not avoid the difficult situation. You know what I love so much? Is that we find in this story, not only was Jesus there in his presence, Jesus was there emotionally 
as well. Look at the description. Look at what, in verse 32, when, when Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Look at verse 33. Here's John slapping the divinity and the humanity of Jesus right up together. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. What does that say? He sees Mary and Martha weeping over the loss of their brother. He sees the Jews that are with him weeping over the loss of a man that meant so much. And here, what do we see? We see people weeping and Jesus weeping. He wasn't just there in his presence. He was there connected to their hurt and their pain. Friends, here's the great thing about Christ. When Christ intervenes in our life, he doesn't throw us a life preserver from outside and pull us out of it. He gets in the middle of it with us. That's the great thing. In order to save us from our sin, what did he do? He became sin for us. To save us from death, to give us endless life. What did he do? He died for us. In order to experience, so I wouldn't experience the judgment of God. What did he do? He experienced the judgment of God for my sins. When I am thinking and looking at my life and I'm in a hopeless situation, I have to remember, Jesus isn't yelling as a follower of Christ. He's not yelling from the outside telling me to get out. He's in the middle of it with me, helping me to walk through that situation. In the middle of your deepest grief, in the middle of your most hopeless addiction, in the middle of your most hopeless scenario you can possibly think, as a follower of Christ, you have that promise that he is not yelling at you to get out of it from the outside. He has leapt into the middle of the scene. He is with you in the fiery furnace. He is with you in your sorrow. He is with you in your grief. You are never going through it alone. And here, the prince of creation, God Almighty, Jesus, the only Son of God, is seen weeping with those who are weeping, knowing full well what he's going to do. Knowing he's going to turn this funeral service into the greatest celebration that area had ever known. Knowing he's going to flip death on its head and leave everybody slack-jawed, he still weeps. He still engages and connects. Jesus didn't avoid the difficult situation. You may feel hopeless. You may have received this diagnosis that many say is hopeless. You may have a relationship that seems hopeless. It's been so bad for so long. Your child may have been wandering for so long and so far. You may look at many things. You may look at your addiction and think it has been going on for so long, for so far, and you may think it's hopeless. I promise it's not. If anything, the resurrection of Jesus Christ teaches us that there is never a reason for his followers to be hopeless. Ever. And here, in the middle of the hopeless situation, hostilities, questions, disappointment, might I even suggest anger and doubt, Jesus walked right into it. Which leads us to number three. Jesus raised Lazarus. (laughs) Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Here's that call back. It's the glory of God. I'm doing something. You didn't see it, but I'm getting ready to do it. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That was a really weak voice I just did, wasn't it? And the man who had died came out his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Can you imagine that scene? Lazarus come hopping out of that tomb. One of those. 
bound hand and foot? Without question, there had to be a tremendous sense of awe. Fear, probably. Confusion. Never seeing anything like that. No doubt, there have been three other instances where Jesus had healed two before this one. One was in Mark chapter 5 with Jairus' daughter who had only been sick for a little while. That 12-year-old, Jesus healed her. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus comes to the funeral procession, touches the casket that carried with it the widow's only son. And he takes that son who raised back and gives him to his mother. And here in John 11, four days dead, Jesus speaks and raises him to life. Let me ask you a question. How did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? There are several ways. Number one is his presence. He was there. Jesus was there at the tomb. Rolled, they rolled the stone away, and Jesus was present. Number two, he said it with his words. Lazarus, come forth. It's been said that it was a good thing that Jesus used the word Lazarus when he called him out, or every dead man in that graveyard would have come forward. You know what Jesus just did? And I can't fully wrap my mind around it. But through the word of Jesus commanding death, commanding that soul on the other side of that mysterious veil, Jesus spoke words that went directly to where Lazarus was because he was still alive. But Jesus brings him back and reunites him with his body through his words. Friends, if Jesus raised Lazarus to life by words, I want to know every one of them. This tells me there is immense power in the word of God. Amen? How often do we read this as though it's a book, just a book? It is not just a book. This is, a, this is the powerful sword of the Spirit that you and I have. The promises of who God is and who we are. What he's going to do. It forms our life view. It reminds us of, of who we are and what he's done. And, and here I have all of the word of God meticulously preserved for me of what Jesus said. And if those words of Jesus can raise Lazarus, I promise the words of Jesus are still powerful. They can restore your marriage. They can break your addiction. I believe it. Do you believe it? Five people believe it. Do you believe it? Yes. That same word of Christ that spoke through death, grabbed a hold of Lazarus and reunited him with his body is the same powerful and effective word that you and I have today. And if it is the word of Christ and the power of Christ in that word, I want to know this thing. I want to know what Jesus said. I want to build my life on it. Jesus showed his power over death. Make no mistake, resurrection always equals victory every time. It always equals victory. But the truth is, outside of Jesus Christ, every other resurrection required somebody else to do it. You cannot resurrect yourself. I could no more resurrect myself because of death and the separation than I could make that chair animate. I do not have the ability to do it. Every one of us is dependent on Christ and Christ alone. That's why he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not what you do, not yourself, not somebody else. doesn't matter. You could go to a dead body and change its circumstances, and it would still be dead. You could go to that dead body and tell it it needed to come alive, and it would never come alive. You could carry that dead body around like a weekend of Bernie's kind of thing and make it seem like it's alive, but it still wouldn't be alive. You could put that dead body in a church pew. And it still wouldn't be any more alive sitting by live people. There's nothing a dead person can do to resurrect themselves. It has to be Christ. And that's why Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. What did Jesus raise Lazarus to? Yes, he raised him to life. But he raised him, friends. For those of you that are born again, remember Jesus raised Lazarus to new life. He who was once dead is now alive. Remember, this is a picture of the gospel. He speaks into Lazarus and raises him to new life. How do I know that? Lazarus comes hopping out 
of the tomb, bound foot, hand, and face. Grave clothes wrapped around him. He was very much alive on the inside, but on the outside he looked dead, right? Jesus says to his friends, unbind him and let him go. Oh, are there not grave clothes that you and I still put on? Are there not old sins and habits of the old man, the old nature? Are there not those sins that you and I participate in and practice in, that even though on the inside we may be alive, the outside we look dead? We live, we talk, we think, we act like the lost world around us that has been unregenerated, but on the inside we're not. This afternoon, family groups all across this area from our church are gonna be asking this question in their family groups. What grave clothes do I have on that I need to take off? The Apostle Paul told us to take off the old man and put on the new man. We were warned to what we were reminded to walk in newness of life in Romans chapter six. We were told to take off the, the sins that so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. It's so easy for us to be alive on the inside while looking dead on the outside. We're called to walk in new life, friends, to repent of those sins. Yes, even have our friends in conjunction with Christ work to help us take those old grave clothes off. Number two, to walk in fellowship with Jesus. In chapter 12, verse one and two, we're seeing the next mention of Lazarus. He's at a dinner with Jesus. Aren't you glad that we get to see this new guy eat? I promise every one of us are probably gonna wanna eat. And aren't you glad that the next thing we know as believers in heaven is the marriage supper of the lamb? Mm-hmm. Yum. We get to eat, friends. What did Jesus do after he resurrected? He proved that he was who he said he was by eating. He went literally from one dinner to another. That's my kind of new body. <laughs> Lazarus is fellowshipping with Jesus, sitting at the table, eating with him. He is fellowshipping with the one who just gave him new life. We're not called to just walk a new life. We're called to walk in fellowship with Christ through prayer, through personal worship, through personal quiet time, through corporate worship, to walk with him, not just on Sundays for an hour or two, but for life on Mondays and Thursdays and twice on Wednesdays. But then you see in chapter 12, verse 11, just flip over there for a minute, it's just a page. Verse nine, excuse me, chapter 12, verse nine. When a large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Do you think Lazarus was too afraid of their death threats? Let's be honest. I'm sure those death threats fell flat. You know why? Jesus defeated death once. What did Lazarus have to fear? Let me tell you guys. I've been doing this a little while. And many of the guys in here that have been doing this longer than I have would be able to tell you that they have encountered even Christians who are fearful of death. And sure, we want to talk about it being mysterious, but I think there's something a little deeper than that. And let me end with this. Death is one of the few times that we have to absolutely, completely trust Jesus. Think about it. I can't do anything to stave it off. I can't do anything to keep it away. It's going to happen. And as I near that moment and my breath grows shallow and my eyes grow dim, I am forced to trust Jesus completely, that his promise is true. And you know what I have found alleviates that fear? Trusting Jesus completely today, right now. To trust Jesus completely with my life, if he can secure my soul and promise to take me to a place that I can't see or locate on a map, having died in a place I've never been 2,000 years before I was ever born, if he can do all that, 
I ought to definitely be able to trust him with my today. I guess my question to you would be this. Do you not just have enough faith to live for Christ? Do you have enough faith to die? Believer, I want to ask you, are you living like that new person? Are you wrapped up in those grave clothes of your old life, the sin that so easily besets us? Or are you taking those off and being an example, a witness to Jesus of the newness of life? If not, I pray that we would make that right with God this morning. You might grab a friend, an accountability partner, and share with them your need, your assistance, that you need help and accountability to help get those grave clothes off. And that this morning, if you have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would be oh so grateful that this morning, this I am is different. It doesn't deal with life as much as it looks down into death and speaks directly at it. Jesus Christ is the only answer for death through eternal life. Father, this morning, help us to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading. Let us be people, if we are born again, let us be people who are walking in newness of life, taking off those old grave clothes, putting on the new man. Father, if we are lost this morning, I pray that today would be the day that we would not leave without placing and committing our lives to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for giving us an answer, not just for life, but for death.
earnestly tender. Church, we're going to worship as we go out. As you go out to the foyer, you see our engaged table. Our, our sponsor, our sponsor, our ministry partner this week is uh, Life Choices. They're having their annual fundraiser, uh, Choose Life, with the, the baby bottles. You take b- bottles and fill them up with change, bring those back in. Um, bottles for change there. Take one of those um, Change for Life bottles and uh, talk with one of our representatives from Life Choices out there. You'll find out more about their ministry. But let's worship Jesus as we go out. I'm fighting a battle You've already won No matter what comes my way I will overcome I don't know what you do But I know what you've done Your spirit is my home. I'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ. I'll sleep right in. and victory that Jesus has bought for you. God bless you as you do.
Thanks for joining us for service this morning. If you made any decisions or would like to talk to someone, please contact the church office. We look forward to meeting you in person.